So James, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we walk into the future, can you tell us a little bit about your own background? Where did you grow up? Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you very much too for inviting me on the Future Leadership Forum, something which is so important to all of us, I think, at this moment in time. On my Twitter feed, I, I have three flags, and uh, so that's actually where I want to start off with. I was born in Derry in Ireland, the son of a Royal Air Force officer, so I have my first flag is an Irish flag. Uh, my second flag is an English flag. Uh, as I went to boarding school for 10 years in the UK. Uh, and also I did my uh, two degrees in the UK too as well. And then my third and my final flag is a South African flag, uh, because this is where I've, I've been based for all of my working career. Uh, and I'm, I'm blessed with a, a rainbow family uh, from this country too. So my hometown, probably somewhere between Ireland, England uh, and South Africa. Something like that, Nick, I think. And tell us, James, what was your dream career when you grew up? It's often quite difficult when you're, you're my age and I'm 57 years old to kind of cast your mind back as to what your dream career was. But uh, an, an old girlfriend of mine reminded me not, not so long ago that I'm, I'm living actually my dream career. Uh, she said that when we were 16 and 17 and we were talking about the future uh, in Suffolk in England, uh, that I wanted to be a diamond explorer uh, and work in the diamond industry. And I've been very blessed to have worked in that particular space uh, all of my working life. Now, can you tell us who inspired you in your early days? I, there, there are three answers to that question, Nick. In my childhood and young adulthood, certainly my mum and dad, uh, they have always wanted me to be, be the best person I could and to try my best. And they were always most encouraging uh, in that. During my corporate life, uh, which was for the kind of next 20 years after university, four, four particular people, three particular people, uh, Bill McKechnie, Alex Van Sale and, uh, and Brian Ainsley, and this was when De Beers was at its technical powerhouse uh, of the diamond industry. And they provided a fantastic solid technical and operational management background. And then in the junior life or the entrepreneurial life I've been living for the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, Dr. John Teeling, who's my current chairman, uh, he is, has a PhD from Wharton. He's a serial entrepreneur. And I'm now running my third company uh, as managing director under him and chairman. And he still remains uh, a visionary and, and a key person in my life. Now, James, I believe you started your career as a geologist, um, first at Anglo-American, then 10 years at Anglo, 10 years at the Bears, uh, amongst which you were the assistant to the chairman, right? Nicky Oppenheimer. That's correct, Nick. That's absolutely correct. Yes. And today you are the chairman of, I believe, the only diamond exploration company in the region. That's so, correct. I'm managing director of Botswana Diamonds, which has operations in South Africa, Botswana and Zimbabwe. Yeah. So, James, looking back over your career, over your illustrious career, would you say there was a major turning point or maybe number of turning points? I think, Nick, there were two turning points. When I, I joined De Beers, I was firmly on the uh, geologist uh, career path line. And I was making my way up the organization, uh, doing good operational management and uh, geological work. And then I was, I was the youngest member of the small geology exco team at the De Beers Dairy Farm Operations. And we were having a visit by the HR consultant uh, Mr. Barry Tapson, and no one on the Exco really wanted to go and do it. And because I was the youngest person, they sent me to go and host Mr. Barry Tapson around the organization. And like any good HR person, he wanted to find out a lot about me. And one of the things I told him that I just completed an MBA uh, through Durham University, where I was very blessed to get a distinction and top student prize. And, and we spoke about all of those things. And fast forward three months later, uh, 
I was appointed a senior technical assistant in Johannesburg. I was put on a multidisciplinary leadership scheme uh, along with six other people in the diamond business of Anglo-American and then went on to become Nicky Oppenheimer's personal assistant. And it all came about from that meeting uh, with Barry Tapson where he identified somebody who could uh, pivot, and I'm not going to use that word more than once, I think, uh, from technical to general management. So that really made my career at De Beers. The second instance uh, was a, a very, very challenging instance when I was managing director of African Diamonds. We were joint ventured with, with De Beers, and of course, De, I'd been with De Beers with, for 21 years, and, and I had an absolutely amazing time. And we had a joint project which we were working on called AK6 in Botswana. And De Beers wanted to apply for a retention license because they felt it was submarginal. Uh, we felt it was profitable and we wanted it to continue. And we negotiated long, 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 long into the night. And at a board meeting that was going on towards midnight or so, I was struggling to kind of separate my old De Beers life with my current managing director's life. And one of our, our local Botswana directors, Mr. Ribson Khabanoi, you know, took me quietly outside, a man of great stature, a man of great wisdom, and, and, and said to me quietly, James, the De Beers which you belong to and the memories in which you have are something of the past. You have new shareholders now. You need to honour them. The long and the short of this one, Nick, is that uh, De Beers applied for their retention licence, we launched a high court action against them. Uh, we won that action. And AK6 is now the Koroi mine in Botswana, which has produced some of the world's most fabulous diamonds, including uh, the world's second largest diamond and a magnificent pink diamond they uh, produced uh, last yesterday. Uh, great oh. employment for the country, great taxes. So those are my kind of two pivotal moments. Great. And James, I also believe you are the chairman of Common Purpose, which is a global leadership organization. Can you tell us a little bit more? Absolutely, Nick. Uh, I, I, there, I'm going to kind of touch on that a, a bit later. But one of the things that was instilled upon me uh, from my time with De Beers, particularly when I was Nicky Oppenheimer's personal assistant, uh, and I was very fortunate to, to interact with his father, Harry, as well, is that if you want to be a leader in an organizer in, in a corporate or an organization, you must demonstrate those leadership skills outside where you don't have authority. And, and Common Purpose uh, has kind of a strap line of leadership beyond authority and uh, cultural intelligence. And I was blessed to be the, uh, the founding director of Common Purpose, which is a, a leadership development nonprofit organization spanning the, the government, uh, private sector and NPO space. And we celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, last year in the middle uh, of COVID. And now our Johannesburg hub, uh, which I chair, uh, does developmental work across the whole of Africa. But I'd like to touch on that a little bit sure. uh, more in the interview, Nick, where we start talking about leadership uh, skills for the future. Thank you, James. Now, before we move into leadership, uh, one final question. Can you tell us what is driving you today? I, I think two things, Nick. The first thing is, uh, uh, even after uh, being in the same kind of role for uh, since I was 21, I still have a you know, a huge passion for my work for uh, trying to press the science forward uh, and discover uh, new commercial deposits for my shareholders. And the second one in, in parallel to that uh, is that this region, Southern Africa, especially South Africa, desperately needs exploration. And why? Because there will be no future mines if there is no exploration. And we are a very mineral rich region and we've missed the last two uh, minerals booms. So I'm trying to do my part to try and generate interest in Southern Africa, uh, uh, trying to convert uh, exploration projects into uh, mines and to basically provide a legacy uh, for my children and our children going forward. So uh, it's, it's are those two things, Nick, uh, what is driving me today. Now, James, let's look into the future. And I know it's a big question, but 
it's a very relevant question, especially now. What does the future of leadership mean to you? I, I think there are, there are a number of strands in, in this one, Nick, and what, one could obviously talk for a long time, but I'm going to try and keep this as pithy as possible. I think many of the leadership principles uh, remain the same, but they're evolving at the same time. So it's something that you've got to kind of grasp what is the best of the past and take on uh, what is developing in the future. And, and what are these? I think it goes without saying absolutely strong ethical values. I think that's so critical and it's always been so critical. Something which I want to develop a little bit high, later on is the whole concept of, of CQ or cultural intelligence. We all know about IQ, we all know about EQ. I think CQ is going to be a really important thing uh, going forward. I think uh, a quote which was attributed to Edmund Burke, but may not be uh, a, a part of Ed, Edmund Burke, is uh, something which goes along the lines of, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I think it's behoven uh, amongst business yeah. leaders uh, to actually speak up from time to time. And then the final point I just want to explore under this uh, section is there are different leadership styles to suit different conditions. We all know that Winston Churchill was a fabulous uh, leader during World War II, but perhaps wasn't the right leader in peacetime actually afterwards. We all know in South Africa that Nelson Mandela was the right time and at the right place in our transition to democracy. So when looks at the, one looks at the future of leadership, you've not only got to uh, uh, understand your own leadership style, but you've got to try and put that into the situation or the context in which you find yourself. Absolutely. And James, what have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important for empowering and building future leaders? I think four things here, uh, Nick, are particularly important. I think you must always have a plan, but at the same time, you must be opportunistic within that plan. I, I've always had plans for much of my life uh, and uh, opportunities have come across which uh, may have not been in the plan, but fitted the context of the plan. So I've actually forwarded, you know, continued with those opportunities. The second part, and it kind of grows from that, don't ever entrust your own personal development to others or a corporate company. It's far, far too important as corporates and, and others will be transient. You must take ownership of yourself. Thirdly, and, and I've said this before, and I might uh, be a bit like a broken record going forward, Nick, on this, is always mm -hmm. have a strong mm -hmm. ethical values. And then finally, something which I'm, I'm very, very passionate about, and, and it comes from uh, the quote that Sir Ernest Oppenheimer made when he was building Anglo-American so many years ago, is that the aims of this group have been and, and will remain to earn profits, but to earn them in such a way as to make a permanent and real contribution to the well-being of the people and the development of Southern Africa. So if you have been blessed to be a leader in the corporate context, you must be able to demonstrate those skills and give those leadership skills back to society in general. Goes back to, uh, I've been a director of Common Purpose for 21 years. I was a director uh, and chair of the South African Ballet Theatre, now the Joe Joburg Ballet for 15 years. You've got to give back and do what you can where you can. And tell us, James, when you address aspiring leaders, what is it you tell them about social media? How should they navigate social media to build their own leadership brand? This is a, a very, very apposite question, Nick, in today's world. I think the first comment I'd like to make here is that you, you have to have a social media presence and you have to manage it. Not having one, I think, would be detrimental to uh, your overall career. So firstly, you have to choose your social media very carefully. Which social media do you want to uh, participate on? The second thing is you've got to spend some time building your site. You can't just log into LinkedIn, add a few things, and then hope for the best. You must populate it with interesting material, presentations, photographs, interviews, uh, and things like that. And then once you've actually built your site, you must make regular, meaningful posts. Uh, and it's something you must do, for example, on LinkedIn, I try and do something two or three times a week. 
on, on Twitter, I, I try and do something maybe once or twice a day. And you've got to have regularity around it and you've got to have consistency to behind it. And then the final thing, uh, you've got to try and avoid uh, the, the controversial subject areas of, of sex, politics and religion, if at all possible. Sometimes it's difficult to avoid uh, discussions on po politics, particularly uh, where we are at, at the moment. But if you are going to venture in that line, you've got to do it with the kind of deepest respect and, and dignity. Now, James, what is your advice for future leaders when it comes to challenges? What are some of the biggest challenges they should expect to encounter in their career? I've got three main headings on, on this one, Nick, I'd like to explore. The first one is obviously a function of the environment in which we live at the moment, and that's to be able to sort the wheat from the chafe. We have so much information at the moment. We have information overload, and there is much fake news or poor quality information going around. Just look at where we are now uh, in, in, in the world in terms of the, the COVID situation and the COVID vaccine and how many non-vaxxers uh, there are at the moment. One of the biggest challenges is to be able to sort the wheat from the chaff. The second thing is remaining focused, humble and patient all at the same time. Uh, one of the schools of leadership uh, that I look up to and aspire to is the one of, of servant leadership. Being focused when there are many competing demands for your attention is, is really important. Being humble when we have a dominance of big leaders and ego-driven personalities is so important too. And, and then thirdly, on that, patience. Maybe you can't buy that nice car right now. Maybe you have to save up for it. Maybe you have to have money in your bank account before you do it. And this is something I've, I've tried to drill down, uh, particularly to my children and the people who I'm blessed to mentor. And then the final two things is one of the, uh, the tests I use when I interview senior managers is called the PA test. It's a very, very simple test. I could basically get my PA to go and reschedule the interviews at the last minute and then to gauge the reaction of the, the aspirant executives in, uh, in, in, in that situation and see how they react. And do they treat the PA with dignity and with respect? And if they don't, just because she's a PA, then I, I automatically fail them because they haven't got the kind of culture uh, that I would like to actually envisage in the organization. And then finally, because we, we live in a very materialistic society and, and people want the best car and the best house and all those things soonest, you must make time to give back. Whatever your skills are, in my sense, I, I, I've tried to give back in terms of my leadership skills. Other people have technical skills, artistic skills, teaching skills, call it what you will. You must give back to society in order for society to grow. Now, James, if you were to design a curriculum for future leaders, what are some of the new skills you would want to factor in? I've got four ideas here, Nick, and, and one of them develops on what I, I promised I would come back to, uh, and that's the concept of cultural intelligence. And unsurprisingly, I like the common purpose definition of that. And, and the definition of that according to common purpose is the ability to cross divides, between geographies, generations, sector specializations, backgrounds and beliefs, and thrive in multiple cultures. Not only does CQ in leaders result in innovative teams, they are also more resilient. We live in a highly connected world at the moment. So what this skill set, if you call it a skill set of CQ, I think is becoming more and more important. And it's something I look at, not just from a common purpose level, but when I look to employ people in many of the countries in which I work. The second one, again, is quite a difficult one, is the ability to be able to drill down deeply into your subject area, but also have a wider strategic and social perspective. For example, I'm a scientist and I'm an engineer at the same time. Uh, people like myself have to read history, politics, philosophy, economics to get, a, to get a good understanding of the organizational, corporate and historical context in which we live. And that's so important. The third one, 
I, I want to kind of honor my mother with as, as well. And it's something we don't do anywhere near enough uh, in the world as a whole. And that is learn the lessons of history. Uh, my, my mother kind of drilled this into me. And just a very small example of this, if you go back to all the pandemics uh, that have covered the world, it's always been the third wave, which has been the highest. And uh, we were caught short with the third wave. So something I will always look at is, if I'm looking at a project, why did it not work from, you know, in the, in the past and from a historical context? And what are we going to do differently to make it work? And then the final thing on this one is, you must have your own personal financial plan. And this is a very, very rare thing. It must be a rare thing because if you actually look at the amount of personal finance software there is available to people, it's very, very limited. I've used Microsoft Money, for example, uh, for, for well over 20 years now, but there is nothing that is better than that. And Microsoft Money was discontinued by Microsoft many years ago. So have a personal financial plan. It's not up to who you work for uh, to uh, manage your retirement. It's up to you. So you can be in a place when you get to your, your 50s where you are more able to take on different and interesting things and give back to society. Now, James, as a mentor to future leaders, and obviously you've been mentored by by previous leaders, like um, I believe, um, this is Harry Oppenheimer, right? In this picture. Uh, this is Sir Ernest Oppenheimer, but I was unfortunate. Uh, he passed on well before my time, but I did know his son, Harry Oppenheimer, and of course his grandson, Nicky Oppenheimer, which was just simply fabulous people. Now, James, as a mentor yourself um, to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored an upcoming leader and that person took your advice to heart. Nick, I'd like to comment on two. One from my early career in De Beers, uh, which gives kind of quite a long uh, career path of, of this gentleman, and one from my time at, at Rockwell Diamonds. The gentleman I'd like to refer to in, uh, from my early career in De Beers, and this was pre-1994, uh, when we, we lived in a very different world, a pre-democratic world uh, to what we live in now, but was obviously within the context of De Beers, which was a, a much more enlightened organization in terms of our uh, country's context. And, and the guy's name was Mr. Mossa Mabuza. He was a De Beers geologist. Uh, he then went on to be, uh, and I worked with him both as a geologist in the field, uh, and then when he became a, a technical assistant in head office, he then went on to become a, 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 a geologist in Anglo-American. And then after that, he was appointed to become a director uh, in the Department of Mineral Economics at the Department of Mineral and Energy uh, Affairs. And now he is the chief executive officer uh, for the Council for Geoscience. And I'm very blessed to still have a great relationship with him, personal relationship to him. And I'm honored to actually be invited uh, to the CGS Christmas parties uh, because of our, our long-standing relationship. And, and, and I hope and pray someone like Mossa, if not Mossa himself, will become one of our future ministers of minds because he's got fantastic integrity, he's got great operational experience, and, and he's a highly technical individual at the same time and has worked on both, you know, he's worked in both the corporate context uh, and in uh, and and for government itself, and he's he's just a super kind of guy, and the kind of guy who uh, would fly the flag incredibly high for for South Africa. And in fact, we were having a conversation a couple of evenings ago uh, when all these riots were starting uh, about my overseas investors, and he was giving me some advice in terms of what I need to do to try and keep them calm uh, during these times. And so, you know, the the, the roles have swapped, which is absolutely fantastic. And then the second one, which is a, a, a much shorter story, uh, I mentored a number of uh, young geologists at, at, at Rockwell Diamonds, my previous job, and, and two in particular uh, have gone on and done some fabulous things. And, and these are the Mohali twins, uh, Petronella and Penelope. Uh, they've both gone on to get masters. Uh, they both gone on to work in Kumba resources, but not only are they working in, in, in uh, 
meaningful and substantial roles in Kumba, they are also flying the flag very high for women in mining. So they are taking a, an industry-wide context uh, in addition to what they are doing at the moment. And, and maybe I haven't touched on that enough is that that's also very important uh, to carry on and, and fly the flag for your industry uh, as well as give back to society itself. And um, James, in your career, looking back over your career, who are the role models of leadership that you have encountered that you would recommend future leaders should study and learn from? The most profound uh, leadership book uh, I have read, and I, I've read many, many of them, and, and, and when this kind of fad, for want of a better word, started, uh, it, I think it all, all, all started uh, with, with Peter Drucker's works, which I find are, are fantastic, The Empty Raincoat and things like that, and, and then Peters and Waterman in Search of Excellence, which I, I thought was brilliant. But more latterly, uh, I, I tend to read a lot more uh, around the, what I call the, or what others call as well, uh, the School of Servant Leadership. Um, and there are four good examples I'd like to share uh, with your audience here. The first one is, is the life of Nelson Mandela uh, and what he was able to achieve with, with dignity and respect and, and with huge leadership in our country. Uh, two people who are alive and present in our country at the moment, uh, and I've been honoured to meet both of them and have fantastic conversations with, with both of them, uh, and that's Professor Jonathan Janssen, uh, previously of, of the Free State, uh, Vice-Chancellor, uh, and now uh, an Emeritus Professor at, at Stellenbosch, and then, of course, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, one of the things I may not have mentioned is that I am a licensed lay minister in the Anglican Church of the province of South Africa, but I've been listening to uh, the Archbishop or the Arch, as he likes to call himself, way back in the, in, before we were democratic and uh, pre-1994, where people of my colour, it was, you know, we were being followed by security state police if we went to listen uh, for Desmond Tutu. But he has been so consistent in terms of his thought processes and in terms of uh, his, his style of leadership. So th those are the three uh, uh, in the kind of public domain. And the fourth in the private domain, who I've also been very blessed to meet, is Bill Gates. Now, we all know he's built a, a magnificent company in, in Microsoft, but he's also given hugely back, particularly in terms of uh, security, IT security, and then beyond that, which I think is his real passion, because this is where I saw him really kind of get animated in my conversation with him, is about eradicating malaria in Africa. Uh, so those are the, the four, Nelson Mandela, Jonathan Janssen, Desmond Tutu, and Bill Gates. Thank you, James. And tell us, how can our listeners connect with you, and where should they follow you? Nick, I, I've got a number of different social media presences. Uh, I've got my own personal uh, presence on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I have the same on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. And as there are many James Campbells uh, in, the, in, in the world, uh, I, I use my middle initials, James A.H. Campbell. So if you Google James A.H. Campbell uh, and you want to go to one of my particular sites, depending on what you're looking for, uh, that should actually provide the, the entrance for you. And last but not least, James, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that they should embrace and implement in their own life? You've asked specifically for one thing, Nick, uh, and it's, it's a hard thing, but it's not really a hard thing. Your leadership must be ethically values-based. It's really as simple as that, uh, if you have to choose one thing. And if you get that right, then much of the rest will actually follow. Well, James, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom into the future and showing us a way and being uh, in a role model ac uh, across your career and your life um, and reminding us that we need to pay it forward. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, for the opportunity to have this interview. And I hope I've added some value somewhere. Definitely. Thank you.